Okay, welcome everyone to our Partners in Progress Connect webinar. I'm David Sherwood from EW Nutrition in Australia. Today's webinar is the fifth in a series of layer focused webinars. And our speaker for today is Dr. Seisha Genja from Highline International. Seisha, could you please introduce yourself? Yep, hi, I'm Seisha. Nice to meet everyone. I work for Highline International. Thanks, Seisha. And also we have with us today as panelists, Marissa Bell Caballero. Marissa Bell is the Global Technical Manager for Poultry for EW Nutrition. Um, Marissa Bell, could you please introduce yourself? Of course. Thank you very much uh, for joining this webinar. Welcome. I am Marisa Bell Caballero. And uh, as David mentioned, I work as the Global Technical Manager on the poultry side for EW Nutrition. As uh, you know, EW Nutrition is a German company. Um, and uh, we are into the feed additives uh, and uh, area. Thanks, Marissa Bell. So after Seisha's presentation, we'll have a Q&A session. And uh, the way to ask questions is to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And you can then type in your questions there. You can type them in while the presentation's going and obviously at the end of the presentation as well. And we'll attempt to answer all of them live uh, verbally or by uh, responding to you during the webinar. If we don't get around to answering your questions, please email us later and we can pick up the, uh, the correspondence from there. And also at the end of the webinar, I'll launch a uh, quick poll questionnaire, which will only take about one minute to complete. And that gives us, um, please fill it out. We have, gives us some good uh, feedback for improving our webinars in the future. Okay, so Dr. Seisha Genga is the Technical Services Manager for Southeast Asia with Highline International. Since 2019, she has worked on disease management production, import, export, welfare, and biosecurity issues with global distributors, commercial customers, and EW Group Flocks internationally. Additionally, Dr. Genga regularly presents on these topics at seminars, trade shows, universities, and scientific forums. Dr. Genga is originally from California and attended California Polytechnic State University for undergraduate studies. She earned her DVM at the University of Tennessee and her Master of Specialised Veterinary Medicine in Poultry Medicine from North Carolina State University. Before coming to Highline International, Dr. Ganger worked for Cargill Turkey Production with responsibility for all aspects of production from parent stock through to the processing plant. She is also a diplomat of the American College of Poultry Veterinarians. Seisha, the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you so much for that introduction, David, I appreciate it. Um, so now you guys all have a, a fairly good idea of what my background is. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get started on our topic today. So um, the point of today's seminar is to really talk about biosecurity and poultry. And when I think about biosecurity and poultry, the things I really want to discuss and focus on are the rewards of biosecurity, the complications that occur, and then lastly, the importance of buy-in. So whenever I get started discussing um, biosecurity, I really want to think about what the definitions are first and understand what it is that I'm looking at and understand what it is I'm trying to do. And then next, I want to consider the highlights of doing those things. And lastly, the rewards that are going to come into play. So with that, when we talk about definitions, the OIE or FAO definition is the implementation of measures that reduce the risk of the introduction and the spread of disease agents. So what does that really mean? Well, it means that biosecurity is really about risk to each entity and that we need to have a level of risk assessment that fits each production program that we're in because risk is about your personal location. It's not necessarily about my company or my country. It's about each individual farm's mitigating circumstances because it doesn't matter if you have a thousand birds or 3,000 birds or a million birds. Each poultry facility has to have a plan that fits its housing type that's unique to the type of situation that they're dealing with. So after we have an understanding of the risk assessment on your personal location, then we need to build a plan that fits the needs of that particular entity. After planning, then we have to actually implement that plan, which is oftentimes more difficult than it sounds. And then lastly, we'll see reduction from that risk. 
The next important thing to remember is that biosecurity really is not a guarantee. Biosecurity is designed around reducing the ability of an infectious disease to come onto the farm. And it requires the uh, adoption of a set of attitudes and behaviors by people to reduce that risk. And it doesn't correct management issues that cause disease. So what that means is we can do the best that we can possibly do, but if there's a failure in any part of that chain, then we may have disease introduction. And then on top of that, sometimes, no matter what the best biosecurity practices you do are, you may still get disease. So it's important to remember this is not a guarantee and it's only as good as the product you put into it. So what kind of risks am I talking about? How do I approach this situation? Well, in general, OIE or other biosecurity resources design biosecurity around the introduction of infectious disease. But there are actually several risk processes that biosecurity helps us with. So disease is the obvious one. We focus on biosecurity in order to focus on bird health. And the factors that we think of when we talk about biosecurity are usually avian influenzas, Newcastle disease, infectious bronchitis, you know, egg drop syndrome. There are lots of different viruses or bacteria that we tend to focus on or consider when we talk about biosecurity. But there's also a public health aspect that biosecurity can help us with, which is discussing the risk of foodborne salmonellas that may cause disruption to our supply chain, disruption to our ability to sell eggs or meat products. And then of course, zoonotic disease, um, which are diseases that can be passed from humans to animals or from animals to humans. And this is a critical area of concern when we talk about how we feed our communities and how we interface with the human populations around our poultry farms. And then of course, the other risks that biosecurity should help us mitigate are really financial risks that are associated with disease. So we're trying to protect the financial aspects of the business as well. And then the last one that most people don't tend to think about when we have good biosecurity programs, it makes it very difficult for unwelcome organizations or groups to enter into our poultry facilities because they won't get past the checkpoints and procedures that we have. So it's a nice way of making sure that the people who are on the farm are the people that should be on the farm. So what are the consequences of not having a biosecurity plan <clears throat> or having a biosecurity plan that isn't particularly functional? Well, there's the obvious one everybody thinks of. If I get disease, I might have high mortality or I might have to depopulate my farm. So that works as a dead birds don't lay eggs, which is true, right? Then there are also political implications. It doesn't really matter how many eggs or pounds of meat you can get if you aren't allowed to sell them, right? So if I have a high path avian influenza positive on my farm, but my birds are still laying eggs and not dying, it doesn't really make a difference because I still am not illegally allowed to sell those eggs and I'm gonna to have to change things up. Next, you can also have morbidity and decreased production. So maybe the birds are just sick and they're not producing as well. It still matters to you as the producer because if you don't have more eggs, you have less money. On top of that, there's also employee health and safety to consider. If your employees get sick because your birds get an influenza that can be passed to them, or if they have pastorella multocida, also known as fell cholera, and this could get passed to a human, there are lots of opportunities that you could have a decrease in your ability to have people working on your farms. This means you might have a lot of eggs, but you have no way to collect them and get them to the market. And then lastly, in some countries, public exposure and perception can cause lasting damage to our business and to the way that we need to successfully rear poultry. Because when you have public exposure and perception that is highly negative towards the agricultural industry without a foundation of understanding of normal animal practices, you can have a loss of control of the narrative that then results in new policy that may not actually help the birds or the industry and business in general. So what are the rewards of implementing a program and having that be successful? Well, the first one's fairly obvious. You're gonna have increased bird health overall. Because biosecurity programs are designed on mitigating infectious disease risk, it means that we're gonna overall decrease exposure to most pathogens, 
which in turn is going to increase productivity because healthy birds are going to have more energy to eat and drink and lay eggs, and they're not going to have to spend so much energy to fight off these other infectious diseases in the area. The other benefit is when we start thinking more about our neighbors and about our poultry community as a whole, because when everybody begins in a region to start practicing some of these good infectious disease processes, we end up becoming more able to protect each other. And I'm sure a lot of you can identify with the COVID risk around the world, the number of events and items that we do on a daily basis to try and help protect each other from this disease risk that is cycling globally. And it's the same thing for our poultry communities. If we can all raise up the bar together, we can decrease the overall level of disease in our areas and we can help each other out. So let's talk about the complications. Um, biosecurity has plenty of complications associated with it. And the first major area that comes to mind is the planning aspect itself. So planning um, can be very hard. So we'll talk about that. And then we will share some lovely images of the different kinds of ways that it can go wrong to give you an idea of, of maybe how to think through some of the processes on your own farms or in your own companies a little bit better. So first, biosecurity can be unbelievably intimidating. And you can have this feeling of where do I even begin? Because you have to think through every single individual step of the process with every individual goal in mind. So where do we start? Where do we begin? Because it can be overwhelming to look at this slide and go, where are my chicks coming from? What about poultry and other animals coming in? Where's my manure gonna go? What about my vehicles and equipment? There are all these very, very complex pieces that we need to consider. But what we need to do is to really think about what each individual risk is, decide what my biggest concern is, and we'll go through an example of that later, and then say, okay, what are the steps I need to take to solve that problem? And that's usually what the next thing that's really important to keep in mind is that one size really does not fit all. So this comes back to when I'm talking about a personal approach to biosecurity. Here we have two housing systems in the same country, but these two housing systems face very, very different challenges. So just because my neighbor down the way is using a shower doesn't mean that if I use a shower for biosecurity that it's gonna fix my problem. You can see on the right side of my screen, I've got a closed house system. So showering in is a great way of keeping the outside environment out of the house and the inside environment inside the house. On the left side of the screen, I have an open house system. So I'm not sure what the potential benefit would be if my goal is to keep avian influenza vectors out of the farm, if I was gonna shower, because I have plenty of access from wild birds that could mix directly in with my birds and their feed and water. So showering is not simply gonna remove the risk of avian influenza in an open house system. So here's another example. What kind of biosecurity needs do we have in this type of production system where we have birds that are outside on range and we face a different set of challenges? So normally I would tell you we should never have other animals on the farm, but this particular animal, the dog at the front, is on this facility in order to protect these birds against predation because there are hawks and other marsupials or rodents that might come in and, and kill these chickens. So the dog provides protection. However, the dog is a fantastic vector for salmonella. And these are things that we have to consider when we build our biosecurity plans of which risks do we have to take because they're necessary to our process and which risks can we scale back or reduce uh, because they will help us achieve our goals. So Next important consideration is that discussion of geographical differences. How do we manage the biosecurity plan for our farm based on our location? Because just because something works in the US doesn't mean it's gonna work in Indonesia, right? So we need to think about how big is our farm? Are all of the farms in my neighborhood, maybe 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 birds a piece? 
or am I working with massive layer complexes or massive broiler complexes where I may have a couple hundred thousand or even a million birds on one site? We need to consider the presence of fighting chickens. We need to consider other animals that might be on the farm. Is it normal for your facility to have catfish ponds in between the shed rows? Is it normal for you to have pigs either living on the farm that are owned by the farmer's family or the village? Are there other village animals that might be regularly living on or moving through your facility? All of these things are gonna change the level of risk that you need to accept and you need to consider. Another very important format for geographical differences is live bird markets. If you live in a community where going to a live bird market is how you normally buy your food, you are presenting an even greater risk from coming to back to your home farm. So these are all things that need to be considered in planning how to best protect your commercial poultry from the things you do in everyday life. And then of course, there's a public interest aspect where in countries like Australia, New Zealand, the US, Europe, there's a lot of public interest for how we are approaching biosecurity and the things that we need to be doing with our birds. And so that always needs to be kept in mind when you're making any sort of plan. So how do I do that, right? This is kind of what I was getting back to earlier when I said we have to start at determining what our biggest risks are. So I've given you two examples here. The first one is influenza. And the second one is salmonella. I like these two and I picked them because they have two very different processes. So if I have my farm and I say, my biggest concern is avian influenza, that's my number one problem. The first step is to sit down and say, okay, where does avian influenza come from? How is it going to get into my farm? Because that's how I plan where I should stop it. So biggest risks for avian influenza are wild birds or other birds on the farm, meaning you're fighting cocks, meaning ducks, geese, anything you might be farming. And then also any sort of wild waterfowl flying into your premise or having any of the small sparrows, thrushes, things like that. So for avian influenza, I need to consider how I'm gonna keep wild bird access away from my birds on the farm. Another risk factor for how avian influenza might come in is via people, employees, or labor. And you need to understand for your employees or your staff, where do they go? Are they going to a live bird market? Are they going to cockfights? Are they going hunting perhaps? And they like to duck hunt or they like to pheasant hunt. Are they changing their clothes in between that? Do they have birds at home? Perhaps they're very into falconry and they may keep their own hawks at home. And these are all questions that become incredibly important when we talk about preventing disease on our farms. The next risk source is infected materials. What are we carrying into the houses with us? What about cell phones? Did you drop it in the dirt outside and happen to bring in some wild bird feces that are now going to contaminate the rest of your facility? How do you disinfect the things you carry into a house with you? Does it matter? All of those steps need to be thought through if avian influenza is your big risk. And then I also have pigs on there as well, because as we know, pigs can be fantastic mixing vats for various influenzas, and they have a high rate of passage both to people as well as to other species. And so pigs could very well be a concern. An example I have is um, I have known people in the past that had a really nice method of mortality disposal because they would take their dead birds and they would go and feed them to the pigs. And that was a great way for them to both feed the pigs and get rid of a, a dead bird issue. The problem with that is that you can have a massive disease outbreak and really set yourself up for failure on the farm. So understanding what possible risks that we have are gonna help us plan. So now let's take influenza and let's kind of change gears and talk about salmonella. So what are our salmonella risks? Well, salmonella is a very different vector. When we think about where salmonella comes from, especially those of public safety concern, it actually is coming from the chickens themselves. So now we need to protect against something that's actually already inside the house, not necessarily coming in from outside locations. So we need to manage the nutrition and the stress and anything else that might occur to the bird in order to decrease our salmonella shedding to decrease our overall risk of public health concern, salmonella shed where we can't sell our eggs or potentially have meat contamination. So 
chickens are of primary concern and importance to look at. We know another local source of salmonella that may be introduced to our farms is rodent populations. So if salmonella is of great concern to your facility, we need to have very, very good rodent control. The mice, the rats, everything else that may be crawling through feed sources, all of that needs to be taken care of to the best of our ability. Other animals entering the farm. We saw a great example earlier of the dog that's on the farm. I've been in many farms in Southeast Asia where it's very normal to have dogs move from the village onto the farms and in and out. It's just a normal population that occurs. And we need to be very aware of the risk that poses to the eggs in terms of salmonella or other bacterial pathogens. Feed is also a common contaminated source and reduction in feed salmonellas can help us reduce shed into eggs and into meat. The next location to really pay attention to is actually dust. Now, dust and checking the fan blades is where we found the greatest yield of positive salmonella cultures when we look at housing. So it's a nice location to evaluate your biosecurity procedures and see how well they're being implemented. And then of course, manure. Check your egg belts. You've got to look at your trays, your egg trays. You need to look at the floor of the house. We need to try and understand how much manure is covering things that our eggs are going to come into contact with and how to prevent as much of that as possible. So that's kind of an overview of the intensity that you need to consider your biosecurity plan for and, and the steps that you need to look at. So what goes wrong? <laughs> I'm sure at this point you can guess that uh, quite a lot can go wrong because it's such an intricate process. So what really occurs primarily is that biosecurity is inconvenient. I think this is one of my favorite quotes by uh, Dr. John Glisson because it truly is. When we talk about the measures we put into place, like taking a shower, like using a foot bath, changing your shoes, it's always an added step that we have to do just to complete our daily tasks. And that makes it very inconvenient. And it makes it very likely for people to try and avoid that and do something else. So that's the first place biosecurity goes wrong. But then there's more. I ask people a lot, how clean is clean? Because I say, are your barns clean? Go, oh yes, yes, they're clean. So well, how clean is clean? Would you eat off the floor? Would you not? Is a little bit of yolk residue okay? Is none okay? Is a lot okay? All of these are really important questions. And yolk residue is at the top of my list because there have been really fantastic studies that actually show the longevity of different pathogens in terms of survivability on their own, perhaps on an egg crate or on the floor versus with yolk residue. And they can extend the life exponentially. I believe uh, mycoplasmas can live up to 60 days and still be viable in yolk residue, whereas they would normally die within three to five days in other fibers. So something that I always look at on farms and facilities with chronic reinfection processes is how clean are your egg belts? How clean are your egg trays? Um, where is your egg traffic going to? And do you have egg crates that are coming back to the farm after going to a processing facility? What's coming back onto your complex? Downtime is also of critical importance and it is so hard to do in a multi-age layer facility. So when we talk about eradicating disease processes like mycoplasmas, we really need to consider downtime as an opportunity to help us with that. You always need enough time to appropriately clean out a shed and disinfect that shed and allow it to sit clean and dry, being the key words, um, in order to reduce your overall disease transmission, transmission risk. I think in general, a good time period to consider or a, a standard accepted practice is between 10 days to two weeks with, for me, I mean, two weeks is really pushing it anyway. You ideally would want to have longer than that, but I have seen people go as short as two weeks. They're just very pushed. So another major risk, obviously, is animals on the farm. We've discussed that a few times. How you deal with your mortality is a huge risk that a lot of people don't consider. If I'm going to go take chickens out of cages, where do I start? Do I start in the back of the house and then carry those dead birds all the way down the front? 
Are they going into a dustbin that is stopping feathers and dander from flying up and contaminating the rest of the birds? Who's collecting the dead? Is it one person going into every single house in order? Or are there different employees inside the houses that carry the mortality to the front and that person doesn't enter the houses? You have to consider what you're doing with your infected birds. And then of course, of course, clothing and procedures. Are you using appropriate PPE and are you following the procedures that you set in place? So egg-related traffic, um, we kind of discussed that a little bit with the egg yolk. You can see in this particular photo, you have a lot of these cardboard egg trays and that works great as long as they don't return to the farm. But cardboard, especially if it gets wet and it has maybe a little bit of mold on it or it gets left outside, using those same egg crate trays again can cause a lot of problems. It's wonderful if you're capable of throwing them away or disposing of them in a clean environment. The other issue is the other plastic trays down under here on the side. And the reason those are a problem is because they're incredibly difficult to get completely and totally clean. Almost always I can pick up one of those egg trays even when they've been washed and I can find some presence of egg yolk or fecal material. And in the past, um, I've been able to do some studies with things like chick boxes and still found salmonella contamination despite excessive washing. So we always have to be very careful about what's gonna come back to our farm from somewhere else. Other animals on the farm, obviously we've discussed the dog. Uh, this is a particular location that had a monkey on the farm, which uh, was because there is a lot of tradition involved with this particular farm to have a monkey is to bring luck and to bring prosperity to the farm. So while I respect the geographical commitments and traditions in, associated with this facility, there is definitely inherent risk of something that may be able to transmit disease, either zoonotic disease to the birds or to humans interacting with the farm. Here's a very, very common practice. I see cats on the farms all the time. And I love cats personally, but they don't belong on our poultry farms. Cats are tremendous carriers of fell cholera. It's a natural bacteria that lives in their mouths. So it's Pastorella multacida. And cats like to get into your mortality piles and they will pull that carcass and drag it all over your facility. And that's a real problem when we talk about trying to keep disease in one location and mitigate that risk. So cats are absolutely notorious for spreading disease around your farms. And it's a struggle because a lot of people allow them to stay with the goal that they're reducing the rodent population. And in my experience, I don't really think you're improving the situation as much as we might like to think. So fighting cocks, this is another big concern of mine. When we talk about decreasing our risks for things like Newcastle disease and avian influenza, because these birds have the sole purpose of going out to other fights and other locations to be introduced to different birds from different locations and have some sort of mixing. So this is a really, really likely infection source for things like influenza in Newcastle because there's a lot of exposure. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with what has been an ongoing outbreak of Newcastle disease in California and the United States. Um, they have spent a tremendous amount of money trying to clean up that problem. And almost always it has been introduced via fighting cock population in backyard birds in Southern California. So this is a huge risk to your farms. The more that we can separate our fighting birds from our commercial poultry, the better off we're gonna be in terms of commercial production biosecurity. So what are some other common things that, that I see or questions that I have? Um, how many of you actually know your farm requirements? Uh, for those of you that might be service techs or veterinarians that are going out to different farms to solve problems or working with your customers or clientele, do you know what the farm requirements are before you go? Do you stop? Do you ask? That's a really essential question for you to think through. Then, are they followed? You might know what they are, but do any of you actually follow them? Or do you just follow a few? What happens each day? Are you still remembering to plan your routes from youngest to oldest? Um, as we know, young birds are highly susceptible to a lot of diseases, and they're often naive to a lot of those diseases. And it's important to plan in such a way that allows us to mitigate the risk to our young birds. 
just because we're doing the right thing, is our customer doing the right thing or are they going back and forth from their lay house and to the pullet house, right? It's really, really common that I might have worked in my pullet house that's that morning. Maybe they were three weeks old and then I needed to go and work in the lay house and remembered, oh, I forgot something in the pullet house. Maybe it's a wrench, maybe it's a different tool. And so I walk back in without changing clothes or going through a procedure because I just want to grab something quickly. And that can be a really common source or a break of biosecurity. And then of course, again, revisiting this idea of how do we collect mortality? So what happens with mortality disposal? Um, there are many, many different procedures for disposing of mortality worldwide. So I'm gonna show you some examples of, of various ways they go wrong. So this is an example of a composter. Uh, composters should be covered and you should always have the layer of birds with another layer of carbon over the top of it. You don't want your dead animals open to the environment. So you can see here, tremendous amount of feather material, wings, and overall carcass that are sitting uncovered in the top of this composter, which means that it's an opportunity for predation for things like possums, raccoons, other small mammals, rodents to get in there and drag those birds out and back into your poultry facility where you don't want them to be. Here's another example of where they're burning the birds, except it's not quite successful. So um, these birds are collected each day and then they're put into these canvas bags and then they're taken to be burned. However, the burn isn't quite hot enough. It's usually not complete. Sometimes they don't get to it in a day or there's too much mortality. And so the bags are left out and you can see many of them have been ripped open and there's been predation that occurs. Um, the other thing is what you can't see in this photo is that these particular burn piles and these bags are less than about 50 meters from the poultry houses themselves. And there's no protection or barrier in between the two which is quite close when we talk about disease transmission and the likelihood of something coming back into your facility. So here's another example of uh, the burning disposal. And you can see that the shed row just behind there, it's completely acceptable to incinerate birds. That is a great procedure and it kills a lot of diseases, right? And inactivates things like influenzas in Newcastles and a lot of bacteria. Um, again, I just always recommend that we take our mortality as far away as comfortably possible from our live birds, simply because the closer you are, the more likely it is that perhaps wind or another animal rodents could carry something back into your poultry house that you had already done such a nice job of taking out. So now clothing and procedures. Um, this is a picture that I love because I showed up at the farm and they're like, yep, we want you to have a, bio, a lab coat on. We want you to change your shoes. And that's what we're going to do. So I got out of the car and I got handed my boots and my lab coat. And I just put them on outside the car. So at that point, there's now no difference because it's the same ground outside as I'd already stepped on with my other shoes. So everything is cross-contaminated. So we need to think through the process of if I'm going to put on a lab coat or coveralls or boots, it needs to be done at that juncture where we separate what is outside the house from what is inside the house. And if you're wearing the same clothes all over the farm without some level of a clean location and dirty location, we're probably not doing a whole lot to mitigate our risk. Here's another example. It's wonderful that we're going to change shoes and step in that foot back going into the house, but the shoes themselves, the clean shoes, are always sitting outside the house where there's wild bird access. So again, this would perhaps be better if the shoes were inside and we use some sort of bench system, also oftentimes called a Danish entry system, in order to swing over and maintain a clean side um, on the inside of the house and a dirty side for things outside the house. So here's a truck wash station. I think these are a wonderful idea to help clean off the wheel wells, to clean off the undercarriage, um, and disinfect vehicles coming onto the farm. So this looks great, but when you go up closer, you see that there's a tremendous amount of algae growing in this disinfectant. Well, as we know, the majority of disinfectants are actually inactivated by organic material. So when you have a lot of algae growing in your truck wash station, you're actually not getting a true disinfection. And then this should also prompt the question for you, how often do you change your disinfectant? Do you check it? 
if you're using certain levels of chlorine to clean the lines or to clean buckets or to maintain your foot bath stations, do you evaluate how much chlorine is in there during the day? How often do you change it? How often do you refresh it? How often do you change bleach powder? All of these things become critical components that are forgotten because the step in the biosecurity process is, oh, I just step in this foot bath and then move on without remembering how does the foot bath work and what do I need to do to maintain that? So another one, this is rodent control. This is probably one of my favorite things. Um, we can't just set it and forget it, right? Just like that foot bath. I can't just put a foot bath down and expect it to always be good. I have to inspect what I expect. I need to make sure the procedures I put in place are working. So this particular facility had a wonderful rodent program and they were doing what they needed to be doing, which is checking bait boxes. Is there still bait in them? Bait boxes should be checked a minimum of once a month, if not more often. And they need to be at appropriate locations around the farm. In this particular case, they had another small mammal that was stuck inside the rodent box. And so this bait box is now no longer functional until we can get out the possum and continue on with normal baiting procedure. So other common experiences that I've had, things that I've seen on farms, um, I'll drive to the office, we'll change clothes and our shoes, but then we'll get back in the same car we drove in and go to the houses. Well, the inside of that car was always infected with outside materials. The inside of that car was always very dirty. So it was kind of silly for us to change clothes and then get back into a dirty vehicle. The next thing I see a lot is that we'll do all of the right steps as the visitors to the farm. We'll walk through spray hallways and then we'll step in the sanitation or foot dip. Perhaps we'll have showers, all of these things. And then we'll go into the house and the farm owner or manager will come in through the back door and not follow a single biosecurity procedure. And what that tells me is they don't take it perhaps as seriously as they should be taking it. And then unfortunately, I have the experience where there's not very much personal protective equipment at all on these farms. And I've got some great research information that I can show you in a minute that says why that might not be such a great thing. So um, with that, let's talk about research. <laughs> what else goes wrong? Uh, there's a wonderful paper on the biosecurity practices of Australian commercial layer and meat chicken farms and the relationship of the perceptions of farmers and the quality of their biosecurity programs. So just a quick overview. On-farm interviews, they did about 25 free-range layer farms, nine cage layer, nine barn layer farms, and then free-range meat chickens, meat barns, and they did this all in the Sydney Basin bioregion in south of, southeast Queensland. So this paper was uh, published in 2018, the survey from 2015 to let you know the, the recent levels. So overall, really nice breadth, many different um, types of operations involved. Points that stuck out to me is that almost all of the farmers did rank biosecurity to be very, very important. However, a lot of procedures weren't followed. So you can see there's a huge variation. I'm just gonna hit the highlights on these, but only about 93% of meat chicken farms had foot bath presences, or rather as many as 93%, and 25% of cage layer farms did. So big discrepancy there on whether or not we're using foot baths coming into our farms. Hand washing and sanitation was 100% of our meat chicken type farms, but then drops off drastically again for our laying farms. Visitor recording was 100% on broilers and 93% for free range and meat chickens, but then dramatically dropping off again for laying heads. And that kind of trend continues. So protective clothing, I think is that other one when we talk about PPE um, and no matter which country you're in, it's happening in your country. Right, 93% of our meat birds were using it, but 24% of our free range layer farms were using biosecurity protective clothing. And the rest of them, almost 75% of farms were not. What about vehicle and equipment disinfection? This is a huge, huge area of concern. Well, in these Australian farms, uh, using things like wheel washes, wheel dips, and whole vehicle washes was not as common as we would hope but sharing of equipment between sheds was common in all farm types and very little disinfection was done of shared equipment across farms. So that's really important to realize is that any equipment that you might be bringing into your facility probably needs to be cleaned and disinfected. 
And if you're gonna use a tractor in one facility, one barn, you might consider cleaning and disinfecting that piece of equipment before taking it into a different shed row. So here's another study that looked at what kinds of pathogens are actually cycling in backyard farms. And this study came out of Laos. And what they did is they wanted to understand the level of cycling occurring in birds in local villages in proximity to poultry production systems. So these guys actually um, published a great study in this uh, last year in 2019, and they wanted to really understand Newcastle disease, coronaviruses, both chicken and duck coronaviruses, as well as chicken anemia virus circulations. So they took samples from 605 different birds in these backyard farms in the Viet Dien Pro province, sorry, in 2011, 2014, and 2015. So they were tested for COV. Cloacal swabs of chickens, 27% and 48% of ducks um, were testing positive for uh, coronavirus titers. And then the oral tracheal swabs were actually significantly lower. It was important to note that 11.6% of all of the oral tracheal swabs and 1.7% of the cloacal swabs were positive for chicken anemia virus with an apparent local outbreak pattern. So that tells us in a lot of these village birds, their disease is cycling that we didn't necessarily expect to be there, both in chickens and ducks. Uh, Newcastle virus was actually a little bit different. I thought this was an interesting fact. Antibodies were detected in 86.9% of the chicken sera. Um, however, they didn't find any actual viral DNA, or sorry, RNA in those birds. So what that tells me is that there's a lot of cycling occurring in the region but there wasn't necessarily shedding going on at the time of sampling. So here's another biosecurity assessment uh, from backyard birds in California based on their proximity to and from commercial premises. And what they looked at in 2016 was 554 different birds from 41 different flocks. And they wanted to know about the common respiratory diseases. So they looked at avian influenza, infectious laryngotracheitis, Newcastle disease, infectious bronchitis virus, ORT, MG, and MS. This was the percent positive on those premises, and you can see that of all those farms, they had every single respiratory disease identified at some point with the highest prevalence of Ornithobacter rhinotracheale, and then quickly followed by Newcastle disease and Mycoplasma synovia. The nice thing that they did was they identified which pieces were attached to biosecurity. And they found that farms that use dedicated footwear actually reduced the amount of positive samples on those farms compared to those that didn't. They found that poultry sourced from regulated programs in the US in this case, the National Poultry Improvement Plan, reduced different seroprevalences of these diseases. And they also found that owners that reported contact with wild birds increased the likelihood of Newcastle disease and Mycoplasma galicepticum. So I like that because it's a really nice kind of recap of this is why we use biosecurity practices. They do help us. So this brings us to our very last point, which is what does it take to be successful? And it's buy-in because you can make the best plans in the world, but it's really the people that are going to implement those plans and make it work. So you need to educate your employees. You need to create buy-in as often as possible. Compliance depends on understanding the program. If I don't understand why you want me to do something, I'm very unlikely to follow along with that program. And then you need to really manage your investment. Describe why procedures are important. Provide choices, footwear and clothing, make sure they're comfortable and they're safe. If you provide nice new sweatpants for employees on the other side of the shower, they're much more likely to shower in and follow your procedures. Minimize their inconvenience. It's not about the pathogens. Make your people happy. Don't take out the things you need to take out, but make sure you make your people happy in performing those procedures. For example, make sure your showers are clean and a nice environment to shower through on. Make sure you have feedback on reality versus the written protocol. Maybe it needs to be anonymous, maybe regular meetings. Make sure everybody follows the same procedures. It doesn't matter if they're a contractor, if they're maintenance, if it's management, or if it's a visitor. Everyone needs to do the same thing every time. 
And then you can also have nice incentives. Build in some extra time in your hourly schedules for showers. Provide free meat or eggs. Um, do whatever you can to improve the buy-in of your employees. And then of course, try to avoid shortcuts at all costs because shortcuts are what get you into trouble. So in summary, biosecurity is really about individual risk of your facility. No plan is gonna be a guarantee of disease prevention. We need to understand how the disease occurs. We absolutely need to inspect what we expect our program to be doing. And of course, the plan only works because of the people involved in the plan. You have the best plan on the planet, but if none of your employees buy into it, you're doomed to fail. So with that, I think we can go to questions and answers. Thank you, Sasha, for a very good and interesting walk through uh, how we can improve our biosecurity, which is so important because everything else becomes easier if we can improve our biosecurity from vaccination to the use of feed additives and management. So thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, yeah, please uh, write in your questions uh, to the Q&A box and we have uh, some questions there. Now there was one very interesting one on asking about fly control um, and manure in open uh, sided houses. And uh, yeah, with that, there is, um, depending on which country you're in, there are some larvicides that you can put into feed. And uh, from, uh, from feedback that I've been getting from, from farms is that that's, that's quite successful. And so that works in the manure then as, um, as uh, preventing the uh, larva from progressing further into flies. And, and the same types of products can be used as uh, sprinkling onto manure as well. So um, that, that, that's one, one tactic. Another one is you can also get fly baits that you can paint on walls and uh, and uh, they've been successful as well in attracting the flies and then and then as acting as a poison on them there. Um, now let me good thanks David and let me address uh, one topic uh, that um, it is uh, very important I think uh, in general for food producers and it is uh, the cost of biosecurity. So that was uh, the topic for a question: How much does biosecurity cost? And uh, let me tell you that, that there are some studies that have addressed this topic. Uh, some of them, uh, let's say, typically say that around 2% of the production cost goes to biosecurity. But I think uh, talking about biosecurity, cost is not, the, is not the most important thing. The most important thing is uh, the cost of not having biosecurity, uh, which uh, can be the introduction and spread of disease in the farm, which is a lot more costly uh, than the cost of biosecurity. And uh, moreover, uh, when we have, uh, like uh, Sage mentioned, a farm uh, with a better biosecurity standard, uh, we may uh, also have a better productivity, which is more money for the producer. And let me go uh, to, uh, through on other questions here. And uh, there are some questions about uh, rodent control. So what is the best method for rodent control? And um, I think uh, the best method is uh, the one that you put in practice first, but uh, the most important thing is uh, to have um, clean uh, surroundings uh, in the farm. And so uh, that will help more in, um, in uh, controlling uh, rodents uh, than having a very, let's say, sophisticated system uh, of uh, uh, traps and baits. Although that is also necessary uh, in, uh, in, in most operations. So there is a combination, but the most important thing is uh, to uh, have uh, the clean uh, surroundings uh, on the sheds and a uh, clean surroundings in the park. Okay, we have another question here. Uh, what kind of insecticides can be used after harvesting broilers in deep litter housing? Uh, so there, uh, usually the main main issue is darkling beetle or black beetle, litter beetle. So there are um, uh, 
different groups you can use. Um, there are cyflutherins and then there are spinosads and phenytrothions and they're all in different groups. So you can rotate between those groups. Say maybe use one for one year, another one for another year, and then the following year go back to the other one and you won't, because they work in different ways, you won't be getting a resistance to, um, um, resistant build up to those insecticides. I've got a question I'd like to go with the answer. So one of the questions was concerning uh, the process of showering in versus showering out. And in light of the idea that showering in would be for the birds, but showering out is more maybe about protecting your family, um, especially in light of Salmonella enteritidis. And uh, definitely the showering in procedure is one of the key points in terms of making sure whatever was outside the farm stays outside the farm. Um, showering out definitely is a method of leaving what's on the farm on the farm. And that's always the way that I viewed it. I want what's on the farm to be on the farm and that's it. I don't want to bring anything in from the outside, but I also don't want to take anything from inside that farm and bring it back out. And if you're not going to any other facility, you're just going from your farm to your home, then yes, showering out is primarily about protecting the people that you are with and the other locations you might go. But an example I would use for showering out and why I always felt it was very important uh, for my own production birds and my own breeder farms was because even though I may only be going home to see my family, I may stop at the bank on the way home or I may stop at the grocery store. And if I didn't appropriately shower out and I maybe I have mycoplasma in my nose and I sneeze at the grocery store, and somebody else comes into contact with that and then takes it to their poultry facility down the road or their backyard birds, I'm now spreading that infection around. And I think this is the same kind of thing that we see with coronavirus, right? Um, we're doing a remarkable amount of transmission by completing everyday tasks we don't think about. So for me, showering out is very important as is showering in, and it's not just about your birds and your farm. And there are uh, various uh, questions addressing downtime. Um, uh, so uh, how long should downtime uh, between uh, uh, farm visits be uh, for farm visitors or uh, for veterinarians and so on? And uh, some are addressing, uh, for example, specifically for breeders, I would say that uh, um, typically uh, it is uh, very well accepted at downtime of uh, three days. So three days without uh, poultry visits uh, uh, is, uh, is, let's say, so far uh, working uh, out and uh, not giving bad results. Uh, though uh, there is uh, not a much uh, scientific studies or scientific literature about uh, uh, downtime or about uh, how much uh, the length of uh, downtime should be. However, uh, respecting entrance uh, procedures, uh, I think, is uh, also really, really important, and it's uh, the most important uh, thing when we are uh, visiting a farm, uh, showering, uh, changing clothes, changing boots, and uh, using uh, adequately uh, food bags, uh, washing hands, and so on, because uh, that uh, will uh, stop the introduction and, and hopefully the spread of disease as well. Okay, so in terms of what is the ideal distance of the incineration house to the poultry houses, um, the ideal distance is as far away as you can get it, <laughs> um, at least in a, an appropriate location. And I'm gonna kind of lump this in with the other one of how, how far is okay between the hen house and disposal pit. For incineration sites, it depends on whether it's an enclosed incineration site or if it's gonna be open bags outside. And ideally, if it's enclosed and you have like a full metal enclosed incinerator, it can still be fairly close, but you just don't want it to have a back traffic where people who are going to the incinerator are then also going to walk back through their houses. This should be the last thing done at the day so that they're then showered out or clean after going to that disposal pit, whether it be an incinerator, a composter or other method of mortality disposal. Um, I, for, I mean, I don't think there's a distance I can put on it in terms of whether it's, you know, 100 meters or 200 meters, but it, the further away you get from your live birds, 
the better that is. The balance that you have to strike is how far is too far that your employees are not going to want to deal with that process or it makes it very difficult for them to get to. There are also some questions addressing food bats and uh, the use if uh, it's necessary to use uh, food bats when you change uh, goods. So I would say that yes, uh, it is uh, necessary. Uh, well, humans uh, are uh, the main uh, carrier and spreader of uh, and spreader of disease, and uh, uh, most of it is uh, uh, where we are stepping uh, in. And of course, even if we change our goods in the house, these goods have been in the house before. And uh, uh, even if they were watched, uh, there is uh, the chance uh, that uh, they still are, let's say, uh, contaminated with spore, viruses, uh, bacteria, and so on. And uh, this is the reason why it is, uh, yes, really necessary to step into a well-managed, uh, well, uh, with, uh, uh, let's say, active uh, disinfectant uh, food bag. So another question I think is, is a nice one here. If avian influenza, um, it has an ongoing outbreak in an area, what can we do for our healthy farms in the same location? And um, sometimes you'll find that uh, something like an avian influenza outbreak, as ter terrible as it is, ends up really helping the process for biosecurity in your region. So when there's an ongoing infection, we need to be incredibly careful with who comes on and off our farms. And you'll see that in countries where there's an ongoing epidemic that's causing a lot of political concern, shut down all visitors. If you know that there is a high rate of low, low path avian influenza or high path avian influenza in your locality, don't allow visitors. Now is not the time to have a technician come out from a vaccine company or from a nutrition company. If we know there's a high disease risk, we wanna limit the number of people on those farms to keep our birds healthy. Check in with your employees. Perhaps it's time to add a second layer of disinfection, more hand washing, making sure that you maybe have new PPE or different methods of disposing of things. So it's a good time to really heighten your awareness and decreasing foot traffic is usually the most important thing. So reducing the number of visitors during those times. And there's, uh, there are more questions about uh, food bats and uh, uh, how frequently uh, should the, the disinfectant be replaced? Uh, well, uh, that will depend on the disinfectant that you're using. Um, you will be surprised, but uh, every four hours uh, will be recommended for many, or for most. And, uh, but uh, the thing is uh, that uh, many times the food bats get dirty and uh, that means uh, uh, we don't uh, appropriately clean the boots before submerging into the food bag. So the first step is to clean uh, as, as you would do with the, with the shed or with the house and then disinfect. So when we submerge uh, the boots uh, in, the, in the food bag, they should be already free of uh, organic material and uh, uh, then uh, the disinfectant will last for these four hours. Otherwise, uh, you will have to replace it uh, before in order uh, for it to keep uh, being active because uh, this uh, um, organic matter will, uh, well, inactivate uh, the power of the disinfectant and you will be basically doing nothing. Thanks, there's a question here on, uh, can you recommend rodent control program which is more efficient, effective to monitor reduction in rodent populations? So good thing with with the rodent baiting is the bait is competing with with the feed that's that's available. So you want the, the bait to be eaten first of all, so you need it to be uh, attractive to the rodent. So the, the, the best way is to use bait stations or bait boxes rather than scattering the bait out in the open because then it can get dust on it and, and dirt on it. And it's not, it's better if it's kept inside a box where it's um, remains more fresh and attractive and the rodents like to 
consume it inside a box where they feel safe. Um, and also to monitor those stations. So you check them, um, you can check them uh, even weekly and you just have like a, a drawing of the farm or the shed and you just monitor when you have um, activity and then you keep replenishing the bait and then over time those stations in that area should start to get less activity. So that's a way of, um, of, uh, of a program and, and monitoring also. And also we probably have uh, time for, I think one more question now, we've uh, almost ran out of time, unfortunately. Okay. So I'm just gonna go ahead and answer uh, this idea about water chlorination reducing the viral load and what's the acceptable PPM in the main or sub tank and at the end of the nipple. So it's a little bit of a convoluted question. Um, I love water disinfection. I think this is probably one of the most critical components that we have in poultry. And yeah, absolutely good water disinfection can result in decreased viral load in water. Um, but typically we target bacteria when we talk about water. There's not as much viral load that's coming in that way, although it certainly can be an issue. In terms of chlorination, uh, there's a couple different procedures you need to look at. And I think this is key to understanding the type of water system you're using. You need to understand if you're trying to understand the oxidation reduction potential of that product or ORP might be something you've heard. And that's gonna require a different testing kit to understand if you're hitting the appropriate ORP. But you may also be looking at something that's just gonna be on a PPM basis, similar to you would have for a pool kit to test the quality or the chlorination level in your pool. So in general, a higher PPM is better as long as it doesn't back off your birds or cause egg quality issues, but standard numbers can be found by most manufacturer's recommendations. And then um, it's mostly important to understand if your system is working. In terms of in the sub tank or in the beginning of the line versus the end of the line, really what's in your sub tank or the beginning of the line doesn't matter. What matters is that what comes out of your nipple at the end of the line is still the appropriate concentration. So it's more important for me to understand how much you have to put in up front to get the appropriate disinfectant level out the back of the house. And that's really what's gonna determine. So what you need to put into your sub tank is gonna be an appropriate amount to get appropriate water disinfection by the end of the line that's not getting eaten up uh, by whatever bacteria you already have in the line or biofilms. If most of it's going away and you're putting in a ridiculous amount, you need to look at either shocking your system, potentially shocking the well or shocking the lines themselves and making sure that you're doing a really appropriate cleaning step in between having birds in the house. Hey, thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Marissa Bell. Uh, as I say, unfortunately we've run out of time, but uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending and for your questions. And uh, as I mentioned before, if, uh, if we were not able to answer your questions today, then please email us at webinar at ewnutrition.com and we will uh, reply to you. And there will be a recording of this webinar on our website tomorrow. And in a minute, I'll launch the poll. So uh, please just take a minute to fill that out. And also please join us next week for our sixth layer webinar, which will be on respiratory disease control strategies in layers by Dr. Seward Chotanen from Chiang Mai University. See you next week. Bye.